I was thrilled to be here. Uh, well, my contribution to this is an attempt to suggest that the question of data management is at the heart of uh, what I like to call digital scholarship. And I want to situate uh, some of the questions that we're focusing on today in that larger context uh, and suggest why uh, I jumped at the chance to, to be here uh, today. Um, as you know, I've, uh, I've had the pleasure over a number of years to participate in Open Access Week. Uh, and um, let's be frank, uh, this is the first time uh, that, to my knowledge, there's been a day devoted to uh, data management. And when I saw that, I said, I'm going. Uh, because I really think it's something that we need to focus uh, a, a lot more on. Um, along the lines of uh, the conversation that Sally got going today, the kind of key point I want to emphasize a lot is the ex extent to which we really are thinking about what's happening today in very, very different ways. How many times have we heard about the notion that we're in a technologically driven uh, society and, and we're reacting uh, to this and my argument today is in fact it's more complicated than that uh, in fact there are deep conceptual changes that we need to talk about that are being enabled accelerated and then influenced so it's iterative uh, then the human technology link is, is one that I think we're all becoming increasingly preoccupied with. Now this has become an emphasis uh, uh, of you know, many, many places. Uh, we saw uh, the tributes to uh, Steve Jobs uh, and the anniversary of his death uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago and emphasized, you know, when we went into Google, this is what we got in, in that tribute. And, and the thing that they chose to emphasize was something really at the heart of what he was all about. And if you read his biography, this was sort of a, a, a key theme in this. And he emphasizes, in fact, that what makes our hearts sing, and in, in fact what makes uh, made a lot of money, is making a lot of money for Apple, is his understanding of what I like to call people in the picture. And understanding that the technology and the, the people and the humanities, the liberal arts, is really where that magic is. A, 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 um, a metaphor that he uses uh, elsewhere as well. Well, here in the Kitchener-Waterloo region, uh, you know that well, uh, Tom Jenkins, um, uh, kind of the driving force of Canada's largest software company, uh, and I, mu I must say uh, a member of uh, the Shirk Council, uh, he thinks about it in this way and uses a, a, a classic metaphor. He suggests, in fact, that what's happening now, a new integration of what he calls uh, tool makers that certainly were the focus of that early phase of thinking about the, the internet. And he says now uh, the action really and the, and the, and the, the, the kind of new uh, component of this are the tool users, creative people, content providers, service deliverers who have learned how to take the images, sounds, ideas, concepts and share them digitally. And as, as has already been emphasized today, to analyze them and, and learn from them in, in a whole new, robust, interesting way. So that's, I think, uh, um, uh, the context within which I'd like to talk about this. And I think it means a, a very different way of thinking about our age. The metaphor that I like is a triangle. And I think there's one side of that triangle is think about the digital technologies. But the other two sides of this triangle are in terms of the content and what I like to call the digital literacies. And that's what's really framing our society. I notice that it's an equilateral triangle, and I think what's clear is that one side of that triangle, in fact, has been much more developed, and we're really coming to understand content, and I mean here metadata, I mean it in a robust way, and literacy, similarly, I mean that in a, in, in a robust way. We need a lot of work to do in terms of catching up and making this an equilateral triangle that really can frame our age in ways that uh, will make a better society. And I think that's one of our hopes in the 21st century. You heard already this morning the notion of a data tsunami, and that's a metaphor that you see a lot. Uh, what's the verb that goes with that? Often surfing is, is one that comes. Uh, and, and it's probably the most popular. What's interesting about that, people point out, well, you don't really want to try to surf a tsunami. This would not, this is not be good. So there were lots of other efforts. So, well, if we can't surf a tsunami, maybe we can harvest it. And, kind of a funny metaphor. I, I don't know how do you harvest the tsunami. Maybe we could tackle it, uh, uh, which would be good. Maybe we could ride it. That would be good. But I think, you know, there's a lot of confusion about uh, what are we trying to do? What is it? And I think that suggests uh, uh, a number of aspects of what we're going to be talking about today. Well, maybe it's not a tsunami at all. Uh, and, or actually, we can behold it. That's good. Just maybe that's what we're going to end up doing. But anyway, the other one, of course, is the deluge. You see that a lot. 
Well, what do you do with a deluge? Well, you try to make sense of it, uh, or maybe you could tame it, uh, or maybe you could decode it, uh, you could cope with it, that would be good, uh, and, and maybe we'll just move beyond it. We'll just, uh, uh, but I think, so I think there's some, there's some so I, I emphasize this because in terms of just conceptually trying to wrap our heads around it, I think is something that's, that's really, really important. Why is this interesting to me? I think about this, this is me in high school, and one of the ways in which I tried to pay my way through and get some money to do things at that time was I worked as a page in a reference library. And I became uh, uh, quite good at a specialized task, which was finding things, this was a reference li library, everything was supposed to be there, uh, and, and it wasn't where it was supposed to be. And I became really good uh, at finding it. Now, sure, sometimes things got misplaced, just human error, it's okay. But I also realized uh, that in fact, sometimes there was very subtle things going on. And I became very interested in uh, where things were in the different classification systems, and what are they based on, and, and on and on. And, it might, and I think it made me very sensitive early on to that whole notion, in, in fact, that when we think about research, when we think about the organization of it and so on, where things get placed, how they get placed, all those decisions have deep, deep epistemological and metaphysical implications. And it really starts to structure many, many things. Well, this went uh, on in terms of I started to read about history and one of the things I discovered was that Canadians, in fact, were out in front of this in many ways. Um, and names like Harold Innes, Marshall McLuhan, and on and on, there's a real new understanding of, of what's happening. Now, Harold Innes couldn't write very well, uh, but he had some really deep thoughts. Uh, and one of the things he emphasized a lot is this notion that in, in terms of, of what he called a, a new mediums and, and so on, uh, that, that over time, that kind of uh, change occurs such that the advantages of a new medium will become such that they will lead to the emergence of a new civilization. And I think this sort of insight, and he, and he, he went on to talk about this in books like The Bias of Communication, which I think are, are just so far ahead of their time um, uh, and John Bonnet has, has a new book coming out uh, on, on, on Innes, uh, I think uh, gives real um, uh, substance to the notion that we are truly living a Kuhnian paradigm shift today. And we are really starting to see, I think, the emergence of a new civilization. And for an historian to say this, this is really big, right? I mean, we're like the profession that says, anytime someone says something new, our mission life, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. If you look back, there's some. So, so we're usually on the side of, of, of saying, hold on here. But, but my sense, at least, is that we are, in fact, really, uh, uh, there's some deep, deep conceptual changes going on, being enabled, uh, accelerated, and then influenced by new technologies. Now, this is important because, frankly, there's been some sense of the notion that what's happening today is just a faster version of what used to happen, that somehow uh, the change is not as deep, and somehow we can just ac uh, accommodate this and build it into a lot of our existing institutions, structures, policies, and, and so on, uh, and, and I don't think so. Um, I went on to learn more about this when I became a historian. I was at the University of Victoria. I really didn't know much about the West Coast. When I arrived out there, I looked around and I said, wow, how about we be, uh, really start to study Vancouver Island, uh, the West Coast, really interesting, the whole Pacific Rim, great history, not much had been done. And, I, and, and since I was new to the field, I said, how about we try to pull together and get a handle on all the evidence that one might want to use? everything that people had written about the island in the past, all the documents and so on. And people said, well, you know, there's the provincial archives of, of British Columbia there. They have a lot of stuff. But I said, yeah, but what about all the records in school boards and in and, and, uh, courthouses and so on? Can't we begin to pull that all together? Uh, this was in the, in the early 1980s, and by this time I, I had, um, uh, was uh, developing big databases for uh, analysis of demographic change and so on. And so I said, how about we try to do this in, in, uh, in an automated way? Uh, and imagine conversations, a researcher comes, sits down at the terminal, says, gee, I'd like to study Vancouver Island. Terminal comes back, uh, we talked about these intelligent databases, come back and said, gee, what would you like to know? 
and you say, well, I'd like to study, say, demographic change or, or economic activity, and so, okay, well, here are some records over here you might look at, and so on. Um, I said, okay, can't we do something like that? Well, we went on to create, uh, to create something, and I learned a lot, um, the automated archivist. And so we said, okay, this would be, this would be really good. And my point in emphasizing this is, one, that it turned out that that was not a good phrase. <laughs> the Canadian Association of Archivists did not, did not appreciate this, and certainly did not appreciate that a historian uh, was, was, was doing this. Now, we were very collaboratory. We tried to work together on and on and on. Uh, but we learned that when trying to tie together uh, what, what was happening in terms of archives. We also, we also didn't make a lot of friends in the library community because we said, you know what, in, you know, we understand that between librarians and archivists, organizing things in terms of provenance, organizing things in terms of subject access, made a lot of sense at one time, but you know what, in the digital age, uh, we don't need those distinctions anymore. Ooh. Not a good uh, uh, friend maker uh, statement. But we, got, we worked it out, we got through it, we built the first SQL application for this sort of stuff, and, and I'm alive to tell the tale. But what I learned in that is the notion of getting together different uh, groups and so on, you really want to do it in what I now talk about as a co-creation model. Uh, you really want, from the get-go, get around the table, and this is something that I think uh, is, a, is, a, is an important point. The, 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 another point I want to emphasize quickly, and Sally mentioned this a bit, the last project that I, that I had a chance to lead before I, I went to SHRC was the Canadian Century Research Infrastructure Project, and I hope that those here in charge of your research data centers now have the public use samples that we created out of the 1911, 2131, 41, 51 uh, uh, censuses. And, um, what was interesting about this uh, um, uh, issue, I, I should also mention related to that question earlier, at this time there was no long form and short form census. It was all long form, which is really, really interesting. Uh, and, and it's all there. But what we wanted to do was, was look at the census data, but understand that that was a human creation that those data were not just neutral data uh, telling us things, but they were the result of uh, many complicated processes. So we got into, well, how was the whole census organized and why did they choose those questions as opposed to other questions? We got at how it was thought about in the papers at the time, how it was understood by people, on and on. And, and we built, uh, sorry, we built uh, uh, this uh, infrastructure that had documentary evidence, it had, had the political debates at the time, it had all the administrative uh, evidence around and so on, and then all the decisions in terms of coding, processing, and so on. And we really tried to, to uh, embrace the notion that in the digital age, um, data don't tell us things. In fact, we interpret them and to understand that they are human constructions and so on is really, really important. And I think this allowed us to really set a framework for analyzing uh, the making of modern Canada in a much more robust way uh, than ever before. And I should also say, StatsCan was a partner in this. They had said, and you know there's a 92 year rule on privacy and so on, and along the lines of what Sally was saying earlier, we were able to work it out and, and arrive at ways to protect anonymity, but also give us amazingly robust uh, data. There are other examples of this. Uh, in the early 1990s, for example, we all had t-shirts in the Data Liberation Army that created uh, the Data Liberation Initiative. I emphasize this because it suggested the possibility of a very, very different business model, a new funding model for data. StatsCan had, had gotten, had been forced in some ways into a space in which they were selling individual files and so on and had a business model that was undermining education, research, and so on. And we were able to rethink that uh, and, and I think uh, the, the, uh, the community across Canada arrived at one that's benefit for our students, researchers, on and on. But again, I think this emphasizes the importance of thinking about the business model uh, up front and, and addressing it in, in creative uh, ways. At Shirk, uh, I, I want to emphasize the notion that in the early 1990s, again, Shirk uh, had a research data policy that's similar to ones that we know today, reasonable period, on and on. 
I emphasize this to say that funding councils can't adopt new policies and then think it's going to really change the world. Because let's face it, we adopted this policy in the early 1990s. Its impact was modest. Uh, there, for all the reasons that we know here today, uh, uh, it, it, you know, we can say whatever we want, but it becomes unenforceable if the context is really not uh, enabling in, in that sense. And that's been one of the reasons why today we're, we're still struggling with this, and we'll get to talk a little bit about that. But the point is that uh, we can, at funding councils, make policies to the extent to which we work with institutions, communities, and so on, to make sure that that's going to fit and be enabled in the larger society. Another point I want to make is, is the extent to which, uh, around the turn of the, of the century, we at Shirk really did start to devote a lot of money to what we thought was a, a really fundamentally different thing. This is the report that, that was done in, 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 uh, in, in 2000, and it emphasized the extent to which this is really an exciting opportunity for scholars, teachers, students, and so on, to become informed partners and innovators. And it emphasized a lot this notion of trying to examine and interpret cultures over time. And it, and it emphasized what became very important, this notion of images, text, and sound uh, in, in this uh, digital world. The other thing that's really important, I want to emphasize here at the bottom, the, the idea that researchers must not only be aware of the technological developments, but also must be directly involved in them. And we started funding a lot on that, on that score. So the Image Tech Sound and Technology Program uh, started, started funding. And one of the good news about this program is that over the last uh, decade and, 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 and a bit, uh, Canadians are now uh, leading the world in terms of the social science humanities contribution to uh, embracing digital scholarship. And there are a number of examples of this, um, but I think it's important in terms of the potential, at least, in Canada to build on, on some of the optimistic side. This was sort of the, uh, a list of some of the topics to be addressed. One of the weaknesses of what was done at that time, I think we now know, is that data management was not put centrally in here. I think all of us underestimated the extent to which that is really at the heart of, uh, of the possibilities that are being enumerated here. And, and one of the reasons why uh, I'm so pleased to be here today and, and a lot of your work is suggesting how much uh, we still have to, have to do. Open access, again, a similar sort of uh, issue in the sense that Canada was the first, or, or Shirk was the first research council in Canada to have an open access policy. The problem, of course, is in terms of implementing that and making that happen, uh, whether it's with institutions or the business model side of that, we still have a, a, a lot, uh, a long way to go. One of the big changes that I think has been at the heart of this is rethinking what's going on. I'm going to give the example of, of journals and university presses. My sense, at least, is that uh, when we thought about journals and presses and so on, a lot of it was about publishing, publishing books, publishing articles, and so on. The new insight is in fact what, what the heavy lifting is, what the work here is in terms of the work of filtering and curation. And, and when you think about the digital age and how it really f encouraged us to get a, a much clearer understanding of what was the work involved, it moved us away from uh, the question of whether it's in print or not and so on, and got us to focus on the substantive task involved, the filtering and the curation. So what did that mean at Shirk? Well, it meant that we changed our whole funding model for journals. And this is, it's astonishing and, and we're just thrilled with this. So in the, as you may know, in the social science humanities research community, the, the way journals are funded are very different from, uh, from the natural science engineering and the biomedical fields. In other words, researchers in our field, 75% uh, of whom don't have any external funding, we don't have a world in which you have page uh, charges and so on. Rather, there's some, some support given to journals that disseminate uh, research findings. What we used to have was support for journals based on subscriptions and, and, and so on, kind of a complicated algorithm. Uh, but instead, what we said was, you know what, let's go back to helping out in terms of the filtering and the curation. And let's 
step aside uh, and move away from the, the, the actual uh, uh, way in which it's disseminated, whether it's virtual or by print and, and so on. So by backing out of that, what did we do? We went from a situation in which the journals in Canada that we were funding were almost exclusively print to a world in which they all have versions of, of E, and this is just in the span of, of uh, uh, five years, astonishingly, and, and it's really changed the whole business model, and I think uh, a, a lot. Uh, Canada, as you know, is, uh, it shirk is uh, onto the uh, uh, Berlin Declaration and uh, the only council, and we're, and we're promoting this in really interesting ways uh, and keeping in an international conversation uh, that I think is, is really at the heart of uh, what we're saying. I want, to, I want to emphasize one project that uh, Waterloo is part of that I think is just an, an exemplar of some of the new ways in which uh, we're really trying to move ahead on this is GRAND, Graphics Animation and, and New Media, brings together universities uh, across Canada in, in one of the networks of centers of excellence funded by us along with NSERC uh, uh, and CHR. And so what are we trying to do? My sense, this is so interesting because each of the themes that are uh, structured within GRAND are led by two people, one from the social science humanities and one from the, uh, the natural science engineering. It's, so it's a co-creation model uh, and I think it's really, uh, really exciting and, and uh, be becoming recognized internationally for major steps ahead. So let's go back to the tsunami deluge and so on, and, and the, the epistemolog epistemological rethinking that's, that's going on in terms of, for example, the possibilities now of analyzing a million books, two million books. How do you do that? And that's at the heart of digging into data that, that Sally mentioned. We got together with our colleagues in the US, UK, and, and now in the Netherlands, and we're trying to expand. And here, the whole notion is, can we uh, come to grips with the, the possibilities of the new digital corpora, corpora that, are, that are out there and really uh, develop the kinds of analytics that do justice both to the data and to, and to the traditions of, of uh, insight from uh, whether it's literature, uh, wh whether it's sociology, on and on, and the new computation, uh, computational parts of that that are, are so exciting. Before, um, uh, before the session, uh, Sally and I were talking about one, just an illustration of this. You may have noticed uh, in 2010, the uh, New York Times uh, identified as one of its best ideas of the year, a project involving uh, a literature prof at the University of Toronto, Ian Lancashire, who teamed up with a computer scientist to analyze Agatha Christie's novels. Uh, and they addressed uh, a question that had been out there. Everyone knows that Agatha Christie uh, uh, got dementia uh, at the end of her life, and the question was, well, when did this, when did this really come in? And they were able to uh, uh, systematically analyze her, her books and actually see the onset. Um, and uh, a couple of interesting c conclusions, and this is looking at uh, sentence structure, word choice, on and on. What's interesting about that, of course, maybe encouraging, is that some of the books that she clearly wrote as she was uh, increasingly suffering from dementia are her most, some of her most famous. So that's interesting, some of her most popular. The, the, other, uh, the other thing, of course, is that they've been able to suggest new uh, therapeutic early identification strategies uh, based on this. And there are lots of other examples in terms of the value of, of really looking at major corpora, whether they're text, images, sound, uh, on and on. At Shirk, we've completely redone our whole program architecture. As many of you know, anyone's been near us the last few years, we erased the board of our program architecture and we said, what would a 21st century approach look like that really can embrace the changing ways in which we're trying to learn about all aspects of the past and present. And we've, and we've worked it around in terms of what we call talent insight connection and also partnerships, which is at the heart of so much of what we're talking about today and really driving uh, a, 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 a key feature of digital scholarship. This is part of and inserts into, I think, this much larger reimagining of campuses, for example. As you know, we're, we're in the process of rethinking 
uh, how we think about education. We've gone from basically teaching to learning. We've, we've gone away from that whole transmission of, of knowledge kind of model to a, a much more engagement model, looking at both content and competencies in an integrated way, a, a much more of a talent approach. Research, we've gone from thinking that specialization, we just add up the knowledge from a bunch of different specializations and we'll understand the, the whole uh, puzzle and in terms of uh, a much more contextualized view of that, what we often talk now about the research T, and in terms of how do we make a better world. We've gone from, a, a, I think, a pretty simplistic notion of tech transfer, better widgets and so on, to a much more integrated and I would argue people-centered model of innovation that has deep implications. And I think digital scholarship has to be understand, understood in that larger thing. Let me just close by trying to give you what I think are some of the driving features uh, that really characterize our understanding of what's happening now. The first one, in line with what I just said, is this notion that, in fact, uh, a lot of those teaching research kind of divides and so on, and when you think about data, Research data are also now learning data as well as innovation data, and, we, and, and it has deep implications, I think, for how we think about what we're doing on campus and how we engage with larger communities. Similarly, it's also clear that it's happening across campus, whether we're thinking about colliding particles or we're thinking about human thought and behavior, I think uh, digital scholarship is really uh, evident everywhere and, and I think is one of the most exciting driving forces. The other thing, and this has been talked about a few times, this whole notion that, that the, the kind of data is so different and how we bring that together. One of the sad parts, for me at least, of the Canadian Century Research Infrastructure Project, the one I talked to you about that had the census data, documentary data, and so on, that now exists in your RDCs as if it's not all interrelated. Uh, the RDCs all said to us, Research Data Center all said to us, well, you know, Chad, it's really nice what you did, and DB2 is really cool, but can you pump out an SPSS file that we can put in? And, you know, and we said, well, yeah, but with all this other stuff, it, sorry. And then I would, some of the RDCs I would go to, and I would see these really fancy plotters and so on. And I was, oh, this is really cool. And, yeah, but they, they're just over there. We don't really use them and so on. So, so the whole georeferencing, the spatial analysis and so on, integrating the different data sets, we have a lot of work to do uh, on this. Uh, again, a whole different thing particularly in our fields, but the use, reuse, and repurposing of data. Um, so much, I think, historically has been on the side of you creating your own data. It was always like you were a little bit of a second-class citizen, second-class scholar if you reuse somebody else's data, like that was a lower form of scholarship and so on, and I think we're really having to rethink that. The other one, of course, is the notion that our data exists in a dynamic state. It's not a fixed state, and what does that mean uh, for all sorts of things, uh, libraries, archives, how we, how we imagine cyber research infrastructures and so on. The issues around privacy, confidentiality, ethical issues and so on, really, really important. We're trying to engage internationally on this. I think it's, it's at the key of uh, what we do. I want to go back to this point that I think on the side of our, our digital triangle, uh, the, the technology side, the connectivity side, the possibility side is so far out in front. Uh, in, in terms of our uh, attention to this notion of the access, the use, the literacies, the, 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 the possibilities of really taking advantage of that. And one of the things that I think is really important is the need for skilled and sophisticated people who are comfortable across the triangle, who, who have a, a under, enough understanding of the technology and content and literacies and can really, uh, uh, can really work effectively in all those. The, the, another big change, I think, the way in which we talked about it for a while was standardization, a cookie cutter sense of all that. And now I think we're thinking about problems of preservation, interoperability, metadata, data delivery uh, services, systems rather, user interfaces on and on in an and world, a both and world. We're not trying, I think Mark was alluding to this earlier, we're not trying to control it all, we want to coordinate. Uh, uh, and, and I love the way Mark was talking earlier about convening, bringing together, working together. It's a networked world, it's not a vertically uh, integrated hierarchy anymore, it's so important. The, I think the, the, the big thing for me still is on this preservation in infrastructure. I think we, I think, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just say one more word about that. I think we're, we're it's a possibility some time ago, uh, there were some uh, 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 historians and so on who were talking about the end of history. 
And I still say, uh, you know, if you really want something to be read by your descendants in a generation or two, get some acid-free paper, write it down, uh, uh, because, you know, history is, is still not kind, and, 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 and I think we, we, we have to be humble uh, uh, about that. Uh, what's also interesting is how the, 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 the business model has changed. Uh, think about the recorded music industry, for example, the way we move from this notion of data ownership to data services and so on, a word that you see increasingly in the libraries around, which I think is really important, but it has a really different sense of things. And I'm not sure that in terms of the research world and so on, how we're thinking about that ownership. I think the cloud is obviously uh, uh, fostering all that, but we do need new business models. And I want to, and I want to emphasize that because I think that's at the heart of a, a lot of the discussions. And just by the by, I should mention that, uh, for example, the, the UK's approach uh, in terms of uh, open access and so on and taking parts of research grants to ensure this, I do not think Canada should follow, uh, and I think we need to think more about the, what are the business models uh, that we like. Um, so this, the, 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 the other notion that's really interesting, the digital age, how face-to-face -face we know now is, is much more important than sometimes predicted earlier. There's lots of research now on who you keep in e-contact with, text and so on, and it turns out that if you don't see them at least once in a while, you're probably not gonna keep it in close contact with them anymore. That face-to-face -face is huge. We were talking about this at dinner last night in terms of learning common scene libraries and campuses as place to get together. Physical face-to-face -face is so important, and I think we need to keep that in the mix. My point, of course, is, is that we need to really update and think about what are the policies and practices, how do we coordinate them better for a robust and sustainable ecosystem for enhanced digital scholarship. And I would say that's the most central challenge uh, for us all. At the moment, we're a little fragmented. Let's, we talk about the federal research agencies. Happily, I'm, I'm pleased to say that CHIRC and CIRC say I chart together, and I'll talk about that. I think we're doing much better. Canary, Genome Canada goes on and on. Campus leaders, we have the, the CIOs, we have the research librarians, VP research, the a, a, VP academics, provost, uh, uh, different models and so on. We have uh, national efforts uh, funded by institutions and the granting councils, Compute Canada, uh, the Research Data Center Network, uh, Data Strategy Working Group, CASRE that worries about standards and so on. The provinces are in the mix, obviously. Private sector is huge. And we have some new groups. Proposals for Research Data Canada, Data Web Forum, although they uh, just uh, renamed that in, in the states. We need to get together in terms of what is the common understanding, who's going to do what to advance this dossier. Some reasons for optimism, uh, uh, you may remember a little over a year ago now, uh, we brought together folks at the, at the Research Data Summit, and I think that report is really useful. In June, the CIOs and VP Research teamed up uh, in Saskatoon at, at, the C at the Cuccio Conference. They've put together now the makings of a leadership council, for example. You look at some of the principles and, and, and some of their, they, they meet very well with, with my earlier list of, of some of the key perceptions, and I think that's important. Well, what can we do? Well, one of the things, and I work with my colleagues, and we want to push on this very hard, we need to uh, actually start to help in terms of what is, for example, a good data management plan. How does that work with institutions? What are the features? How can we do that and enforce it in ways that make sense for all of us and that will help researchers get there? Similarly, we need, uh, we, we need to really uh, rethink this, what is a, a contribution in terms of data scholarship? This has, this has lots of things, whether it's tenure promotion, grants, and so on. And my sense, at least, at the moment, that this whole notion of creation of, of a data, put in, in a trusted repository, use a good data management plan. At the moment, for example, I invested five or six years of my, or seven or eight years of my life in, the, in, in working with others to create the Canadian Century Research Infrastructure. There's nowhere on my thesis, to, uh, on my CV, to put that. Not there. So uh, that's an issue. And finally, we need to, I think, engage, engage internationally in terms of, uh, you know, what are other countries doing? How are we thinking about that? What can we share with each, uh, with, with each other? And how can we benchmark progress and monitor how we're doing in Canada? Because I think it's really important. Uh, uh, 
couple of challenges very quickly, just to remind you again, the 1961 census was the first census in Canada that was, was uh, um, made machine readable. You can't read it. Uh, they're still trying. Uh, it, it's, uh, but there's long list, long list. And again, how many of you created files five years ago, two years ago, 10 years ago that you can't read anymore? Those floppies, various levels, you know, uh, write it down, acid free paper. The other, thing that's, the other thing that's really important, I think, is this question of measurement and evaluation. What we're counting now is still reflective of, of, an, of a different era. Uh, and I think it has all kinds of implications for many, many sorts of things, whether it's rankings of universities, on and on, how we think about things. We need to get serious about the question of what do we want to count, how do we want to count it, how do we want to measure, evaluate, and so on, because if not, it's going to lead us uh, into, into bad places, whether it's on campus or in our efforts to make a better world. Finally, a, a theme that's come up today a lot is this notion of bringing together different ways of knowing. We've spent hundreds of years now establishing you know, what, what C.P. Snow talked about as, as separate cultures and, and so on, the two cultures. There are many ways to think about this. We have some work to do in terms of that T-shape, in terms of getting people comfortable uh, in, in the fact of, of their different ways of thinking about it. We built granting councils, for example, that were largely siloed. We're working now to do a much more overlapping Venn diagram approach. Uh, we still have some work to do on that. We're focused on it, but, but we have some ways to go. Final optimism, we asked uh, profs across Canada in 2008, very robust survey. How do you think about your research? How do you characterize it going from extremely interdisciplinary to exclusively disciplinary? Four groups, extremely or exclusively disciplinary, extremely interdisciplinary. Fascinating now, it has become not cool to call yourself exclusively disciplinary. And that's true in the humanities, social sciences, and this one over here is history. Uh, you always got to emphasize that. And, but what's interesting, the most um, favored way of describing your research today in the social science humanities is quite interdisciplinary. So there's optimism there. When we look at our students, this is the Globe and Mail did this survey. They asked students, where do you want to work? And the two companies that popped up the most were Apple and Google. And what I found so interesting is that students in the social science humanities on the right here most want to work at Apple and Google. Um, and I think that's reflective of how our students are very different. Will they get jobs? You may have seen, for example, the Google VP a little over a year ago said that Google was uh, hiring 6,000 more graduates, three to 4,000 in the humanities. So I think the, the companies are getting this, and I think we're gonna get a much more integrated, robust way of thinking about it. Thank you so much. Right. And that's why it can't be that way. We can't be saying, you think of a good data management plan. And that's why I think the work that the, the, the councils, I think, and I think, uh, I think we're there in terms of agreement, is to say and to work with uh, Carl, to work with CIOs and so on, to try to get agreement on what are the key elements of a good data management plan, so we're not inviting anyone uh, 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 out of the sky, and two, how is, it, how is it reasonable to expect that that's going to work in the various institutional settings? Uh, and that's where I think we got a lot of work to do for exactly the reason you imply. So do you see the insight in sharing all that to administer the whole data management instead of having some isolated? We don't want to create any new structures. I think digital scholarship is something that cuts across. I'd like it to become mainstream, part and parcel of the way we operate. Right, well, they're, they're, uh, and my uh, closing slides, I, I think, are, are uh, relevant here. So, um, my sense is that uh, the, the, the ground is fertile in terms of change. Why? Because uh, it, when you look at profs, 60% have been hired since 2000. And in some places more, I was just talking to a colleague at the University of Alberta, 72% of all their profs have been hired since 2000. I don't know what the number is here, but it's a big number. It, it's a big number. It, it's at least 60, and my guess, it, it, it's higher. So the, our profs are not profs uh, back. And, 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 you know, I love my generation. We're, we're just wonderful. But uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, I think the kind of renewal is, is being enabled by 
uh, the arrival en masse of a, new, of, a, of a new generation. So that's good. Secondly, I think most change on campuses uh, is driven by students uh, in many ways. And my sense, at least, is that students are driving this in ways. And I, and I tried to, I mean, it's astonishing, I think, for a history prof, when he looks at his students, to think that their two top uh, ideal employee, employers are Apple and Google. So that's really interesting in terms of, uh, of that. So some optimism there. The, the third thing is, when we started uh, really renewing our whole program architecture and, and making some you know, really fundamental changes, some people did tell me, they said, Chad, nice idea, they're gonna hang you publicly. Uh, don't do that, uh, this is not good. And in fact, it turns out that um, I, I think uh, the, the, the courage to move ahead and to, and to uh, articulate the where and the why and the importance of it all and, and so on, get that kind of an engagement model that we used uh, and, and certainly here at the University of Waterloo, you were deeply engaged uh, with us on that. I think it was evident at the Congress last spring where uh, uh, Waterloo and Laurier uh, really showed in terms of all kinds of interesting events during the Congress of the Social Science Humanities that, that in fact the, the, the appetite is there and the willingness is there and so on. So my sense is, yes, uh, well people say, you know, uh, institutions don't like change or people don't like change. And I think that's misreading. I, my example always is, you know, someone comes up to you and says, hey, you know what, you won the lottery. Nobody says, you know what, that's gonna really change my life and you know, I, I really, that, 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 and even though the data suggests often that, that it's gonna go south. What people, what, what, what people don't like is what, what, what a lot of the research talks about is a sense of loss. So, so the concern is, I think in terms of change, is I'm gonna lose something that I really value. And you're saying I'm gonna get other things, but you know what? I'm not so sure, but the thing is, I have something that I really like. So our approach has been to say, we're not rejecting the last number 100 years and so on. We're immensely proud of that. And I think, you know, historians, we don't like to emphasize progress, but then whenever you, you know, you ask an historian, when would you like to live? We all say, you know what, on balance, I'll choose today. Thank you very much. So, so, I, so, so we don't want to just hold us bowls throughout the, uh, the past, but we want to say we can build on that get rid of some of the stuff that, that really is anachronistic and doesn't fit anymore, embrace a new world, and in fact, my argument's been that this gives us the opportunity uh, to really focus on human thought and behavior and the importance of it in ways that we never have. Some of it's a little humbling, you know, look at our math school systems, we spent 200 years building math school systems that we, research is now starting to show Fly, they're organized in ways that fly in the face of how we learn. Now you think, well, you know, didn't somebody like ever think about like how do people learn back in the day? And say, you know what, is, is kind of a factory military model really useful here and so on? Well, some people thought about that a bit, but no one really took it seriously. And there were no real efforts. You think about early IQ testing and so on, led to all kinds of things, modest, modest research. Uh, underpinning that and all kinds of, uh, of other issues. I think it's only in the last decade, two decades, three decades, that we've said human thought and behavior is something that we can understand. Um, I get this as an historian, I'll tell people, you know, I, I, I studied demographic change in the 19th century, basically why people have kids or not. And I, sometimes I get the reaction, people say, you don't know why people have kids? Like, <laughs> If you research that, why didn't you ask me? Or, or the other answer is, you're trying to figure out why people have, are you kidding me? Uh, we'll never, I mean, give that one up. Uh, so I think we now have a new confidence, the way I think we did in taking seriously that we could figure out in terms of you know, whether Einstein's uh, uh, scribbles were, were really right or not. Uh, we got serious about that in terms of everything from colliding particles on and on. We started to really say, you know what? We can take that seriously. But I think in terms of human thought and behavior, it's only recently. So I think my sense is that we're in a, in a really exciting time, uh, but we have to articulate that in ways that people say, wow, let's go 
we're not rejecting the past, we're building on it, but we're moving way beyond it, and this is just a great opportunity, and yet I'm not gonna lose anything, in fact, that I really value, it's it, in fact gonna increase in, in value. Well, uh, first of all, and, and, uh, and I was one of the reasons I, I wanted to come to this was to listen to you, because you're, I think, one of the, of the shining examples of, of, of the possibilities. And, you know, I think, so many examples like IPY is, is, is you know, historically those kinds of events uh, uh, end up with such amazing results that over time historically have just faded by the by and nobody can remember. The fact that, you know, there's a concerted effort not to lose that, to build on it and so on, I think is, I don't know if it's unprecedented, but it's close. And the way in which you're doing that, I think is in keeping with what, what we're doing here. I think all these things, uh, uh, frankly, it, 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 you know, uh, we, we meet the, the, the f uh, three uh, tri-council presidents and CFI, the four of us meet on a monthly basis. Uh, I have, they have, they give me full support to champion this dossier. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm focused on it now. I couldn't focus on it as much in, in the last number of years, although we did digging and various things because we were doing a lot of other things like program architecture renewal and so on. But this is my priority now and I think uh, they support it fully. And my sense is that this year, if folks like you can speak up and give the kind of support and Sally and others, I think we can make rapid progress. Yeah, ter terrific. The, the one example that jumps to mind has worked on what led up uh, to the Arab Spring. Uh, and now, uh, and, and basically, you know, systematic analysis of social media, when did the makings of the Arab Spring, when can we trace that to and, and, and so on. Uh, and and um, uh, 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 um, IBM, for example, right now, one of their priorities is what they call sentiment analytics, where they're looking at social media in terms of sentiment, anger, happiness, all this sort of stuff, right? And, and bringing, you know, bringing uh, the social science humanities experts to bear on this. How do you do that? Uh, the, the kinds of words and so on linked to uh, various kinds of emotions and how do you systematically analyze that for for all the text this is happening on the research world we're certainly funding it uh, it's happening uh, Sally was asking earlier in terms of security uh, uh, happening it's happening and the companies are into this now obviously how is our brand being talked about how do people feel about our brand in terms of social media and, and so on uh, uh, so I think it's one of the most interesting uh, dimensions of the analytics that's going on. How do we do that and how do we do it in a robust way? Uh, what do we conclude from it and so on? How do we interpret all that data? We have a lot of work to do, but my sense at least is, is that it's opening up some really interesting possibilities for us, again, in terms of trying to understand human thought and behavior.